This is The Red Line, where we interview three geopolitical experts on one big subject shaping the news both here and overseas. And I'm your host, Michael Hilliard. It's always been interesting to me, looking back and seeing how many supposedly settled facts have been eventually overturned by the march of history. Sometimes when new information comes to light, it can completely overturn years of collective agreement. New information, single events, can completely change the entire world's perception of a particular knowledge of information. And to focus on just one of these major paradigm shifts, I want to talk about an event in November of 1940. Up until that point, the battleship, or the periodic equivalent, had been the dominant part of every nation's fleet for centuries. Whether it be the American ironclads or the British dreadnoughts, it was almost a universally agreed upon fact that the battleships and their giant guns were the most important part of any navy, and being able to blast your adversary's coastline with your big guns would win almost any war, and admittedly they had a lot of precedent to back that up. That school of thought though proved to be incredibly stubborn, lasting from the ages of sails and gunpowder right up into November 1940, for all of you non-World War II buffs. 1940 was the early stages of the conflict, but by that point France had already fallen, the Germans and Italians were fighting against the British in North and East Africa, and the British were just holding on to their own home islands with the skin of their teeth. Looking for any quick propaganda victory, the British Mediterranean force decided to try a low-risk attack on an Italian harbour. The British weren't looking for a big win or a decisive battle, they just wanted something to brag about in the press. The British, using just one aircraft carrier, launched 20 lightly armed biplanes off the deck of the HMAS Illustrious. These were old propeller-driven biplanes. The planes launched that evening looked like something more likely to be used in the First World War than the Second. The planes were launched from the middle of the Mediterranean Sea, heading towards the Italian fleet docked in the southern Italian port of Toronto. At the time, the raid was seen by the British Admiralty to be a bit of a throwaway. At best, they might hit or ding an Italian ship, and in the worst case, they lose just 20 nearly obsolete naval planes. The first wave of the British bombers hits Toronto at 10.58 at night, and the Italians were caught by surprise. Giant battleships were all tied up one next to the other in port. During the raid, the swordfish continued to dive down at the stagnant ships and drop torpedo after torpedo into the side of them. The raid was unlike anything anybody had ever seen to that point, and by the time the second wave of British biplanes had arrived back on the deck of the HMAS Illustrious, they had not only knocked out three Italian battleships, an Italian heavy cruiser and two destroyers, and all of this was achieved for the cost of just two nearly obsolete British biplanes. When British High Command received the reports, they were absolutely flabbergasted. The British could have lost 1,000 planes that night, and the cost of attack would probably have still been in the British favour, as comparatively, Planes are very cheap to make, but ships, ships are expensive and time-consuming to create. This moment showed the world just how much damage planes could do to big, bulky battleships. And with these planes being launched from an airfield both in the ocean and moving at great speed, it made everyone sit up and rethink the battleship's position as the pride of everyone's fleet. After all, what's the point in building an incredibly expensive world-class battleship if it can be sunk by just a handful of British hand-me-down planes. Within a year, the admiralties from fleets all across the globe had thrown out their battleship-focused doctrines and accepted that the age of the battleship was over and the age of the aircraft carrier had begun. The aircraft carrier now is the pride of whichever fleet they're part of, allowing a nation to plonk dozens of latest generation fighters anywhere across the globe with just a few weeks' notice. After seeing time and time again how useful and how decisive these carriers could be, these carriers kept getting bigger and bigger, until today when we arrive at the latest US ship, the USS supercarrier, the Gerald Ford class. An absolute behemoth of a ship, a vessel more akin to a floating city than any sort of warship. These carriers are nuclear powered and armed with up to 90 latest generation fighters on them, but all of that power comes at a price. For a Gerald Ford class supercarrier, there are four carriers scheduled to be produced. Just this particular class of supercarrier required 4.7 billion US dollars to design the four ships, with each of these ships costing 13.3 billion dollars to produce. And once they are made, they then need to be staffed by up to 4,500 personnel and up to 11 billion dollars worth of fighters 
without even accounting for the long-term cost of staffing it or the upkeep or the fuel or the numerous other ships the US has to buy to then protect the supercarriers, each operational Gerald Ford class is estimated to be worth around $25.6 billion. And to put that in context for you, just one fully loaded and operational supercarrier is worth more than the entire annual military budgets of Iran, Iraq, North Korea, Venezuela, Myanmar, Ethiopia, and Cuba combined. And to add even more eggs to that overly filled basket, if just one of these aircraft carriers was to go down to a missile strike, it would mean more US casualties in a single afternoon than the entire eight years of the war in Iraq combined. To lose a single aircraft carrier would be a devastating loss to say the least. And even as big and invincible as these floating almost suburbs seem, there is an ever-growing list of threats towards them. From suicidal unmanned aerial vehicles, to undermanned underwater vehicles, to the latest generation of Russian and Chinese submarines, to long-range stealth bombers, to cyber attacks, and now on top of that, the latest range of hypersonic missiles deemed to be carrier killers. Missiles that Russia and China are rolling out that for as cheap as just $100 million dollars can travel at Mark 27 and supposedly break a carrier down the middle. So should the US be investing $25 billion into a ship that could possibly be sunk for just 0.4% of the cost, will the thing to kill the United States supercarrier be the missiles, the subs, or just the plain economics of war? That's the question we're attempting to answer this week. And to help us figure out how we got here, we turn to our first guest. Part 1. The Floating Fortress For the better part of half millennia, they the gun-armed capital ship, or what would later be known as the battleship, previously the ship of the lion, previously the galleon, was seen as the ultimate arbiter of decision-making at sea. And it doesn't really matter whether that's, you know, uh, Tudor sailing galleon Nelson's victory, HMS Dreadnought, or USS Iowa, the fundamental pattern of all of those things was it's a ship that carries a lot of guns, usually big guns for the time, and that's how you, you win at sea. But then you have the Second World War, and the narrative that's come out of the Second World War, especially the narrative that's come out of the Pacific War, which is very important because obviously World War II really cemented the United States as the uh, premier naval power. In that element of the conflict, the carrier really came in and displaced the battleship. Um, it's then obviously gone on to become a very, very large vessel in US Navy service and is still seen in, in many ways rightly as the ultimate now arbiter of how you m dominate the seas. Drakinefell is a naval historian and expert on the development of Western naval strategy and is widely regarded as one of the most comprehensive sources online when it comes to naval history and the development of naval tactics. And we're thrilled to have him on the program today. So in the immediate run-up to World War II, the US had what were called fleet problems, where they experimented with how they were going to run wars. And although carriers were definitely a very important part of it, especially from 1930 onwards, they did think that carriers were still an ancillary part of the fleet, basically there to facilitate the major battle between the battleships. So how did these famous battles like Toronto or Pearl Harbor actually change the thinking around the orientation of how naval fleets are constructed amongst the major naval powers? Was it an overnight acceptance that aircraft carriers would be the future of naval warfare, or was it a more slow drift? Taranto, which is the attack by the Royal Navy on the Italians, um, they use a single carrier with a very small complement of torpedo-carrying biplanes to cripple a decent portion of the Italian capital ship fleet, and that rolls back uh, Italian capabilities for several months. Now, the US does take note of that in some quarters, but not enough of them. And then a few months later, you have Pearl Harbor, which, because the Japanese are using a lot more carriers and a lot more aircraft, has considerably more important results. The US is now faced with with kind of a fait accompli. The car they have fewer carriers than they have remaining battleships, those carriers are faster than the battleships, and critically for a force that is now outnumbered, the 
aircraft carriers not only have speed but they also have range because a battleship can only really materially affect things that are within range of its guns so 15 miles 20 miles at most an aircraft carrier by 1941-42 can reach several hundred miles and so you have this kind of perfect storm of events so by the end of world war ii the americans the british and the french are all scrambling to build numerous aircraft carriers having seen their incredible impact, particularly in the Pacific theater of the war. And as we progress into the Cold War, many of these nations' fleets now become battle groups designed to protect and assist the carriers. Ships that began World War II as ancillary vehicles had now just become the core of most of the Western naval forces. Moving to the Cold War, though, naval strategy became about blocking in the Soviets. In contradiction to the American strategy of naval force, the Soviets though never really go that far down this path and never put aircraft carriers anywhere near the top of their to-do list, instead focusing more on cruisers and submarines for the Soviet fleet. So if we're to accept that carriers really are the be-all and end-all of naval warfare, then why would the world's second largest superpower neglect building many aircraft carriers? For Britain, which is a island nation, being able to affect the seas is very important. For the United States, which is not an island, but if it wants to affect things on a global scale, it also needs to affect the seas. A fleet is still an incredibly important thing, because anywhere that the US might realistically end up fighting is going to be across the Atlantic or across the Pacific. For the Russians, however, they are far more interested in what's going on on the European border. And Russia has a very large physical border with Europe, which means aircraft and tanks and men and etc. can just march west. Um, and similarly, various tensions with China, they have a big land border there. The northern Russian coast is icebound most of the time, which means that actually Russia has a relatively minimal amount of coastline compared to its overall size that's accessible for ships during the entire entirety of the year. And for Russia to achieve its objectives in the Cold War, it doesn't actually need a particularly large fleet. And therefore, if they don't need a particularly large fleet, they don't need to contest control of the seas, they therefore don't actually require aircraft carriers. And it's, it's the same kind of principle that you see going back hundreds and hundreds of years. If a nation is primarily a land-focused nation, then their fleet, if they have it at all, is usually quite small and will only really consist of coastal defence craft. Now, during the Cold War, that does begin to change. Um, the Russians start to build, as nuclear submarines come along, a large fleet of those. They start to build uh, frigates and um, the Kirovs, which some people call battle cruisers and so forth. But even then, those forces are not designed to dominate the oceans they are designed more as effectively a massively glorified raiding force the main objective of the russian surface and submarine fleet apart from nuclear deterrence during the cold war is to disrupt cripple or sink allied reinforcement convoys that would be coming to europe they're not supposed to be sitting there controlling the ocean they, they have a kind of we go out we do this we come home mission so, for decades, naval doctrine accepted that aircraft carriers were the pinnacle of most nations' fleets. But this episode is whether aircraft carriers are becoming obsolete, which would have been an unthinkable question if we even ask any time between the end of World War II right up until about 1982. See, 1982 was when the United Kingdom went to war with Argentina in the South Atlantic over the Falkland Islands. And until that point in time, no nation the UK had been fighting against had ever posed any sort of threat to their carriers. But Argentina was different. Argentina had Exocet missiles. Missiles that largely caused the British to lose six ships in that war. It was early days in this particular conversation, but even then people were starting to ask, what was the point in building these huge ships if single missiles can take them down? Even today, when you speak to most Argentinians after a few kilometers beers, they'll almost certainly lecture you that the Argentinians would have won the war in the Falklands had they had just a handful more Exocet missiles. So I want to get your analysis here. Did the age of the carrier end right here in the South Atlantic, or did it just spark a lot more research and development into ways to further protect the carriers through things like ABMs and increasing operational range? It's a, it's a difficult one because the Falklands is one of those conflicts that has so many slight 
changes, if you like, alternate history options where things could go one way or the other. One of the more important things, I think, to note is that, yes, whilst Exocet was a very serious threat, and the Falklands, one of the lessons from it was that surface-to-surface -surface or air-to-surface missiles are actually a considerably larger threat than everyone had thought, the flip side is that some of the losses to Exocet actually either reflect one-off failures or actually systems working as intended. So, for example, Atlantic Conveyor, um, when she was hit and lost, she, um, she was actually hit by a missile that had been aimed at the carriers but had been successfully decoyed. It just unfortunately happened that by decoying the missile and causing it to bypass the carrier group, it happened to fly in the direction that the Atlantic Conveyor was in, um, which was a bit unfortunate for them. And Sheffield had a reasonable chance of defending herself, except for the fact that she was caught um, in the middle of this satellite communication, which happened to shut down her radar, which meant she didn't see the attack coming. The Argentinians did try to launch a number of other attacks, both bomb run and exosets, at the carriers. But what's not often appreciated is we've probably all seen the footage from the Falklands of you know Argentine aircraft flying over Royal Navy ships at very, very low altitude. But that's all happening in San Carlos water during the amphibious landing stage where they're able to use the radar cover and physical cover that's provided by the Falkland Islands themselves to get very close. So whilst having a few more exosets could have compromised the Royal Navy's ability to fight, perhaps by crippling enough of the amphibious landing vessels or amphibious support vessels to make a landing more problematic than it already was, I I don't think a handful more exosets would have been a serious threat to the carrier group itself, simply because the carrier group was far more able to defend itself from the position that it was in. Where the aircraft carriers do seem to be the most useful is when a major power is fighting a minor power. As an example, in American operations against Iraq or Libya, the aircraft carriers and carrier battle groups proved absolutely game-changing to the situation on the ground, as it gave the Americans air superiority almost right away. Whereas parking an aircraft carrier off the coast of Russia or China today probably wouldn't have the same effect. So can you take us through the usefulness of an aircraft carrier against a minor power like Iraq, as opposed to a major power like China? In some respects, the carrier has become more and more powerful as technology has advanced, not because of what the carrier in and of itself is, but what that technology has meant for everybody else. Because... You know, at the mid to late part of World War II with some of the Essex class and then in the immediate aftermath, the Midway class coming online, the ability to loft 70, 80, 90, 100 aircraft was already built into aircraft carriers. However, whilst that hasn't really changed all that much because modern jets are considerably larger, which has matched the increase in size of the American supercarriers, the costs of those aircraft proportionally have increased massively. So whereas if you showed up off the coast of a given nation in, say, 1945 or 1950, that nation, even if it's a relatively small one, might be able to field hundreds of aircraft. So your 100 or 80 aircraft might be considerably outnumbered and you have to really hope that the quality of your pilots and so forth will make up some of that difference. That, that makes using an aircraft carrier, even against a smaller country, a somewhat difficult proposition without significant um, other factors, either having multiple carriers there or also having a land-based component to your war. So you look at the Korean War, it's a typical example of that. But then as time has gone on, now a smaller country, if it has an air force at all, might only have an air force that numbers in the dozens. And if your carrier is still carrying 70, 80, 100 aircraft, and if you're the United States, you have multiple carriers, all of a sudden you can now show up with an aircraft carrier whose onboard air force might be considerably larger than the effective air force available to most countries. The, the exception is when you are looking at places like China or Russia, which still have air forces that are considerably larger than any realistic carrier air wing. 
but that's when you have the idea coming through of using multiple carrier decks similar to what they were doing in world war ii to have this force multiplier effect because if you have four or five u.s carriers show up you now have 250 300 plus aircraft and whilst the total number of aircraft in an opponent air force might still be considerably greater than that the number of aircraft they can bring to bear locally uh, in the area that the carriers are is going to be less and so the carrier still remains a somewhat viable method of contesting the air and making strikes on key targets etc i think nowadays where the the major risk to carriers comes in is not necessarily the existence of subs because subs ex have existed for you know well subs actually existed before the aircraft carrier did um, and a few aircraft carriers have fallen victim to subs but far more subs have fallen victim to aircraft carriers it's probably more in the shape of anti-shipping missiles which can be carried by enemy shore-based aircraft but they can also be launched by enemy ships enemy subs and if you get close enough even land-based launchers if we take a look at, let's say, an American Ford-class carrier, which fully staffed and equipped, could be worth as much as $24 billion, are we putting too many eggs in the one basket? Do you think we're walking into another dreadnought situation? Which, to explain a bit about what that is, much like the carriers of today, the great powers put a lot of effort into their capital ships before World War I, building these gigantic battleships known as dreadnoughts. They were the pride of the fleets of nations like the UK, France, and Germany. But for the majority of the Great War, they just sat in port the entire time. You see, both sides have built up so much value and emphasis around these dreadnoughts that their admiralties, especially after the skirmish at Dogger Bank, were far too scared to actually use them. Fearing the loss of even one or two dreadnoughts would be completely devastating to that nation's naval capabilities. So with us building up so much around the aircraft carriers, do you think that in the event of a hot war with someone like China, that the US Admiralty may be tempted to fall into a similar trap? and give the aircraft carriers so far back and out of harm's way to prevent them being hurt or sunk that it would actually limit their overall usefulness in the end. After, in the First World War, when you have, after Jutland, you, you do have expeditions by both fleets, uh, mostly the Germans and then the Royal Navy with the Grand Fleet responding, but they do become a lot more risk averse, as, as you mentioned, and even at uh, to be honest, at Jutland, that risk aversion is present on both sides. Admiral Scheer does get to confront the Grand Fleet, but he confronts it in a position that he determines is disadvantageous and possibly not one that he can pull a victory from. And so he decides that rather than chance his arm and let's see how this goes, he decides to turn away almost immediately. But oddly enough, when you look at the Second World War, at that point, people have significantly fewer battleships than they do in the First World War. There are fewer battleships in the world total in World War II than there were at Jutland, um, just between the two sides present there. But the Royal Navy, the US Navy, and even the Germans, even though they only have you know two to four, depending on how you classify the Scharnhorst, they do put their battleships in harm's way. Um, granted, a bunch of them are therefore lost, but they they do realize that if they have these capital ships, then they need to force a decision or they need to affect the enemy by utilizing them. And you know, you see the same thing with the Falklands. So I think these days, whilst there is obviously going to be a huge amount of risk aversion, because there's a huge amount of money, as you pointed out, a huge number of crew, huge amount of prestige, and also a huge amount of tactical um, capability invested in a single aircraft carrier. You know, if, if an aircraft carrier goes down or is crippled, it's not just that you've lost for either permanently or for a length of time the aircraft carrier, it's also that you've lost your ability to exert your will in that theater of war. Um, if there's multiple carriers in a battle group, you can still exert it to a degree, but it's been significantly reduced. So when and where you invest your big striking force is going to be a, a much more cagey, much more reserved decision than perhaps it would be in an era where you could, say in, in the Second World War, where it's you could almost throw four or five Essex-class carriers forward. And although obviously you still didn't want to lose them, you could do so in the knowledge that if 
something went horribly wrong and you lost them all, you had another 15. So it didn't matter as much. These days, as you pointed out, you know, if you if the US has 10, 11, 12 carriers, if they lose one or two, that's a significantly uh, greater proportion of their fleet than perhaps previous losses would have been. But also, you can't replace a nuclear carrier very quickly. These things take, you know, half a decade to a decade to build. So it's not like World War II or even World War I, where if you lose a bunch of ships, you can probably construct their replacements over the course of the conflict. If you lose an air, a nuclear-powered aircraft carrier on day one of a five-year World War III, you are 99% not getting a replacement before the war is over. But at the same time, I, th I think that the, the balance is different for the US and China because any kind of likely war between the US and China is probably going to involve Taiwan. And if it doesn't involve Taiwan, it's going to involve something that's happening in the Western Pacific. Now, for the Chinese, if they have their carrier fleet, it's one of many options because they also have their land-based air forces, they have their submarines, because those submarines basically can wait for the enemy to come to them, which makes them considerably more stealthy. So for the Chinese, a war in the Western Pacific, especially around Taiwan, which is only 100 miles away or so from mainland China, had they have so many different potential avenues of defense or attack that it would make much more sense for them to guard the use of their carrier forces quite a lot and maybe use them in a very specific strike roles and then pull them back kind of in a way almost similar to the way that the soviet surface fleet was going to be used against allied convoys in the cold war whereas for the us their nearest friendly land bases are going to be places like japan australia guam etc and they may or may not have access to those bases, depending on if, if those nations are getting involved in a particular conflict. They may or may not have access to those bases because they're physical bases that don't move. They may have been targeted and knocked out by Chinese missiles, at which point the only way for them to project power against China will be via the use of their carriers, uh, because submarines are very good at area denial. You know, They can force other people to not be in an area by either sinking them or by the fear of them being sunk but you can't affect too much change against the enemy's land-based assets using a submarine and ultimately that is what decides wars unless you go via the economic blockade and starvation route um, ultimately you have to either destroy enough stuff on land to make the enemy throw their hands up and say fine or disrupt their supply lines enough or eventually put boots on the ground and whilst a modern sub admittedly yes can launch cruise missiles they have a relatively small payload and therefore re relatively small ability to affect the enemy on land whether that be their air bases or whatever and it also compromises a submarine in significant ways because it's a fairly obvious thing when you start launching missiles and submarines rely on their stealth um, kind of ninja with a flashlight scenario but an aircraft carrier carries considerably more munitions, um, it has a lot more independent strike options because it obviously has multiple aircraft. And so in any kind of conflict in the Western Pacific, the US is almost certainly going to be forced to use its aircraft carriers by necessity, apart from anything else, at which point it then comes down to a relatively binary decision of, at least within a certain sphere, Either the US must use its aircraft carriers to affect what it wants out of a particular conflict, or if they choose not to, they are basically ceding that conflict from day one, which at that point there isn't a conflict. So <laughs> it's kind of um, a moot point at that, at that stage. So most of our eggs are in just a handful of baskets. And whilst the US can feel quite comfortable plonking a carrier group in the Persian Gulf to dominate the skies above Syria or Iraq, China is a whole other beast. In the event of any war with China, the US would have to bring the fight to them right across the entire Pacific Ocean. Or whilst knowing that getting within 3,000 miles of China puts them in range of a jagged, interlocking array of missile defense. 
And whilst yes, a new generation of Chinese hypersonic missile deemed a carrier killer does cost up to $50 million each, that still means that China can throw 100 of them at each aircraft carrier and they'd still come out financially ahead. So what should the US do? Double down and form unkillable carriers or increase the range the US can strike from to fight China from outside their killing radius? Or should they start to take some of the eggs out of these $25 billion baskets? Would we'll answer that, we turn to our second guest. Part two, in hot water. Well, I guess the first thing to say is that they've become more popular. Most notably, we've got China joining the ranks of aircraft carrier nations, you know, in earnest, uh, three so far and almost certainly more to come. But Japan has uh, converted one of its uh, amphibious ships or rather is in the process of converting one of its amphibious ships into a mini aircraft carrier that will carry vertical takeoff uh, fighters. South Korea also has ambitions in this area, although the new government shows some tendency to pull away from this. Uh, and India, which has long been an aircraft carrier nation, is uh, it has definitely you know reinforced that tradition by launching a fairly large aircraft carrier just this year and uh, we're now on sea trials and also with ambitions to to build an even larger one. So I guess that's the main thing to say is that aircraft carriers have become much more popular in this region. Sam Rogovin is director of the Lowy Institute's International Security Program. He was also a senior strategic analyst in the Australian Office of National Assessments, where his work dealt mainly with North Asian strategic affairs, including nuclear security and the development of Asian military forces. Sam has also worked in arms control policy in Australia's Department of Foreign Affairs and as an analyst in the National Defence Intelligence Organisation. Sam is widely regarded in the community as an incredibly sharp policy developer, so we're very happy to have him on the program today. So this has been my argument for some time, that in fact, uh, aircraft carriers are not very useful weapons in what's often called peer-to-peer -peer conflict. Uh, and that is because the ubiquity of uh, high-speed anti-ship missiles is now such that uh, these very large and very expensive platforms become inordinately risky to operate within range of, uh, of such weapons. You know, you, you, can, you can put an aircraft carrier out of operation with just with a, a single or a couple of hits or, uh, from uh, small uh, anti-ship missiles. That's not to say that the missiles will sink the carrier necessarily, but you can cause you know, an operational kill, basically making the, the aircraft carry impossible to use uh, just with a few hits from uh, anti-ship weapons. And anti-ship weapons are now highly accurate and very difficult to defend against. Uh, and also, by contrast to the aircraft carriers, are incredibly cheap to acquire and then to operate. Uh, and that means, I think, in turn, that aircraft carriers are mainly useful against uh, countries that really don't have much naval power of their own and certainly don't have the ability to threaten uh, that carrier when it comes in to uh, uh, close to uh, their shores. So if you're aware of this imbalance and I'm aware of this imbalance, surely China is as well. So why is China then making such an effort to build up its fleet of aircraft carriers at the moment if it's aware how vulnerable these carriers can be? Yeah, that's a real mystery. And we know that China knows this. You know, the Chinese are not uh, naive about this because we saw in at least the first 20 years of their uh, the modernization that began roughly in the early 1990s, we saw a massive investment in the very kind of anti-ship capabilities that I just talked about. So China is now at the forefront of developing these high-speed uh, anti-ship weapons, including the development of an anti-ship ballistic missile. It's the first country to develop that kind of weapon. So China fully understands and has internalised uh, this idea that large surface ships are incredibly vulnerable uh, to uh, anti-ship missiles. So that does raise the very question that you're now asking. If China knows this and has actually internalised it and made it part of their force structure, why then turn around and build aircraft carriers of your own? Uh, and I think the answer to that is that the Chinese will use uh, that kind of capability, not against peers, but against small countries that don't have much power uh, to otherwise oppose them. And that's actually pretty consistent with the way that the Americans have used it since the end of the Cold War. 
The Americans have used aircraft carriers largely against countries that don't have much naval capability. Uh, Iraq, Libya, Yugoslavia, for instance. Uh, and of course, they've used them as what I would call constabulary weapons, uh, weapons that help the United States maintain uh, the order that they have created and are, um, you know, very much want to defend, but are not really designed to win wars against peer competitors. How useful are these area denial weapons, though? Even if they can't get too close to the Chinese coastline, how effective would they be at something like closing the Malacca Strait to unfriendly nations or positioning themselves within the Indonesian archipelago to deny passage through them? Yeah, well, look, all we can do is judge by history, and the history actually is pretty thin. I mean, there hasn't been much naval warfare uh, since the Second World War. And so that's why I think historians and naval strategists have to place a lot of weight on the very few instances that it has occurred. So the Falklands War in, uh, in 1982 is the outstanding example. And I think a lot of analysts have argued that but for a handful more uh, Exocet anti-ship missiles, Argentina would have won that war. Uh, and certainly, you know, caused a lot more damage to uh, to the British fleet, perhaps to you know the aircraft carriers and the major uh, amphibious ships that were part of the uh, uh, the British task force that was sent to retake the Falklands. The more recent ex example, I guess, is um, is the loss of the Russian cruiser Moskva in the uh, uh, in the war against Ukraine. You know, it, it can be argued, of course, that that the ship was was badly prepared and that uh, the Russians generally were badly prepared for the war. Of course, uh, but again, we, we we did see an example of anti of, of small, light, very cheap anti ship missiles having a devastating impact on uh, uh, on ship uh, on incredibly expensive large ships. So we've seen a kind of cat and mouse game playing out over the last few decades, where anti ship missiles gain increased range, so then the other side works to increase the operational range of their carrier aircraft, with both sides looking to top the other. Which brings us to the position we're in now where carriers can effectively use UAVs to refuel, enabling fighters to launch from thousands and thousands of miles away, hit their targets, and then return to the carrier. If the carriers keep developing and increasing their operational range, staying out of the strike radius of the coastal anti-ship missiles, does that make them impervious to these kind of strikes? Well, except the, the range of the aircraft that the Americans operate, for instance, off their, off their aircraft carriers is not getting longer, it's getting shorter. Uh, this has been a pretty well-established trend since as long ago as the Second World War, but certainly since the end of the Cold War. Uh, and it's been well chronicled by uh, the, uh, a report in, I think, 2018 by the Centre for New American Security, a report that your listeners can look up called The Retreat from Range. Um, and it shows that in particular since the end of the Cold War, when the first Bush administration uh, cancelled the A-12 Avenger program, which was a long range stealthy strike aircraft that was going to be operated off the carriers. And that was cancelled as part of the peace dividend after the end of the Cold War. And what it, what it meant was, though, that that uh, the strike capabilities that the Americans could muster off aircraft carriers were there thereafter of much shorter range, and these days reside largely in the in the form of um, the Super Hornet, which the Australian Air Force also operates. And look, truth be told, for a long time after the Cold War. Well, the Americans didn't need much range because, again, the, the aircraft carriers were being used against uh, adversaries that didn't have much anti-ship capability, so they could afford to bring the ships quite close in. Uh, and indeed, I think the force structure reflected the fact that the aircraft carriers were being expressly you know, designed to operate against non-peer competitors. Uh, now, of course, things are changing in the Pacific with the emergence of China as a major, uh, a major power. And the United States is making some, I think, halting efforts to return to uh, to long-range capabilities, but it's it's far off achieving that. Some important context for this conversation is a concept written about frequently within Chinese defence papers, a concept usually referring to the five island chains, which can always be viewed as a kind of stages of influence. If we try and lay out the map for you, the first island chain, where China feels they are now, runs from the southern coast of Japan, west of Okinawa, down the west coast of Taiwan and into the South China Sea, along the west coast of the Philippines and the east coast of Vietnam. Within this first island chain, China felt confident that its naval and land-based forces could harm or destroy an opposing fleet, and that any operation the US would run within the first island chain 
would come at great risk to its naval assets. More ambitious members of the Chinese defense community hope that China will extend its naval and air dominance to the second and third island chains, as well as eventually the fourth and fifth island chains, with the fourth and fifth being within the Indian Ocean. But focusing on the first two, the second island chain runs from the south of Japan, way to the Pacific, engulfing the Philippines, all the way to the west coast of Guam, and into Micronesia, all the way down to Papua New Guinea. Weirdly enough, this is roughly how far the Japanese got at their height during World War II. If we move to the third island chain, if achieved, would divide the Pacific in effective half, running roughly down the international dateline from the Bering Strait between Russia and Alaska, down to the west coast of Hawaii, engulf all of Micronesia and Melanesia, as well as most of Polynesia, carrying on to run all the way down to the northern tip of New Zealand. Again, this is a very long bow to pull, but it is their kind of wish upon a star goal here. So right now, even China feels that strategically, they are confined to operational supremacy only within the first island chain, mostly due to the US carrier fleet and land-based assets all around the other island chains. But if China was to build up its aircraft carrier fleet, is that the ticket to them gaining operational capacity within the second and third island chains? I think there are real constraints on China's ability to operate beyond the first island chain, but they don't have much to do with American carrier power. They have much more to do, I would argue, with American and also Japanese uh, submarine capability and, and also other anti-ship uh, and anti-submarine weapons. The carriers, I think, don't contribute a great deal to that capability. They do some, but they are so vulnerable that in a, in a war against China, I don't imagine that they would be on the front lines in uh, in trying to stop uh, Chinese ships and submarines making it beyond the first island chain. I think that would be the job of, you know, of land-based air power, but largely of uh, of submarines. And submarines are where China and Russia are putting a lot of their R and D investment money into at the moment. So are U.S. carriers developing countermeasures at the same rate the Chinese are developing their submarine technology? Do the new Russian Yasin class or the Chinese Type 94 or Type 96 submarine pose a credible threat to US aircraft carriers? Uh, so one of the things I'm really looking for in regard to the PLA uh, aircraft carrier program is how quickly they incorporate unmanned combat air vehicles and unmanned air vehicles of all kinds. Uh, the United States has been extremely reluctant to embrace that air power revolution. Uh, I think largely for bureaucratic reasons, the, the the pilot lobby is very powerful in the in the Pentagon, and so uh, it's been slow to really embrace what is an incredibly promising technology for increasing the strike power and the endurance of uh, of uh, the aircraft carriers' air groups. Uh, that that's slowly changing with now the Americans, the U.S. Navy is testing a an unmanned air vehicle that could operate in the first instance as an air refueling platform what what i'm looking for is to see whether china really embraces that technology more and and relies more on uh unmanned air vehicles than the americans uh seem able to do right now and what are the advantages you get from running an unmanned aerial vehicle as opposed to a, a trained pilot who has been doing this for years I mean, you reduce the cost firstly because you don't need a crew on board the aircraft and therefore you don't need uh, the huge infrastructure that sits behind the crews, uh, which is to say, you know, the, the kind of training aircraft and the, and the training uh, capabilities, the uh, simulators and the hundreds of, of, of aircraft that are required simply to uh, keep carrier air crews, you know, combat ready and, and up to date. So you... Um, uh, you hugely reduce that burden and also uh, on the aircraft themselves, the unmanned aircraft obviously can carry uh, more fuel if they don't have to carry the uh, the pilot and all the support systems. They can also carry more weapons uh, and the turnaround times can be much faster. So it just promises much higher sortie rates uh, at much lower cost. So from what I understand, what you're saying is that even with the US's massive naval supremacy and capability in spending, that in the event of a war over Taiwan, you would assume that the Navy would never sail its carrier groups directly into the Taiwan Strait like they would in the event of a war between themselves and Iran or Libya. That the US no longer feels comfortable operating directly off the Chinese coast. Well, first of all, there's, a, there's an a priori question about whether you'd want to. Uh, so would the United States be prepared to escalate 
uh, a war so that it would include large scale air a large scale air campaign focused on the Chinese mainland because if it does that then it is in essence expanding the war and inviting China to uh, also strike targets on the mainland United States and when that happens I think uh, exchange, a nuclear exchange becomes much more realistic than it would if you implicitly agreed to keep the war localised rather than expand it to the mainland of both of both countries. So that's the a priori question. Would you want to hit the Chinese mainland given the risks involved of, of, of nuclear escalation? Uh, and then the second point, how would you do it? Well, I think at this point, most military analysts would say that China has the most comprehensive and sophisticated air defence system uh, of any major power uh, of its own continent. A mixture of indigenous and Russian built air defence systems, not only missiles, but also, of course, uh, aircraft of various kinds, including now fifth generation fighters. The, uh, uh, the J-20 is, by all accounts, a very capable uh, aircraft, uh, fifth generation stealth aircraft. Uh, and all sorts of, of Russian and Russian systems and Russian copies. So it, it would be a big job to get through that air defense bubble and to incur you know substantial damage to the Chinese mainland. And that's even putting aside the risk of, uh, to the aircraft carriers themselves that would be you know the base for those kind of airstrikes uh, because the aircraft carriers would be within range of China's submarines uh, and importantly of its of its long range anti-ship weapons. So how does China's missile defense systems compare to, let's say, Israel's Iron Dome or the US's THAAD program? I think it's a matter of scale. So the Chinese simply put a lot more effort and devote a lot more resources to putting a, you know, a huge air defense bubble uh, over key parts of its territory, uh, much more than the United States does, for instance, which has fewer, runs fewer risks of direct attacks against, uh, against its mainland than, than China does. So yes, I think it's largely a question of scale, but also sophistication. As I said earlier, it's, uh, it's buying uh, the most sophisticated Russian systems and also developing some very impressive capabilities of its own. Well, circling back to our previous question about submarines, how much of a threat do you think the Type 94 and Type 96 Chinese submarines or even the Russian Yasin class new submarines pose to something like the American carrier fleet? I think there's probably less concern about Russia now than there is about China. Uh, I mean, we're, we're now on the verge of seeing, I think, a pretty substantial surge in Chinese nuclear powered submarine capability. Uh, there's a new building uh, a new construction yard that is that is finished uh, and Chinese technology is starting to catch up so um, nuclear powered submarines has always been a bit of a a bit of a drag on overall Chinese military modernization they've always been a bit slower uh, and a bit less capable in that area than they have been in many others but it, it looks like we're we're about to see a step change there with new classes of uh, of nuclear powered submarines entering service over the next few years but as as to whether you know why they are such a threat i mean uh, the 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 old uh, logic really hasn't hasn't changed much for many decades, which is that uh, submarines are incredibly hard to find. I mean, in exercises, uh, the Australian Navy, Australian Navy submarines have had very good success against uh, aircraft carriers, American aircraft carriers. Uh, so have many other countries operating, you know, quite small uh, diesel submarines. Uh, there's no reason to think that uh, that China can't catch up in terms of its, you know, quieting capability for submarines, uh, and that submarines will be a you know, a really deadly threat to all large surface ships, including submarine, uh, including um, including aircraft carriers. Obviously, it's hard to make exact calls here, but based on what the Chinese have been putting into their Type 95 and Type 96 submarines, do you think this gives us any indications of any strategic direction the PLN is heading in at the moment? Are they prioritizing area denial or are they prioritizing nuclear weapon delivery or carrier killing? Uh, what can these new subs tell us about China's future naval ambitions? Well, at the moment, it looks like they're going to introduce what, what pundits uh, are calling both the, the Type 95 and the Type 96. So one of them will be a ballistic missile submarine. And the US Navy, I think, is projecting that they could build up to 12 of those. And the other will be a, an attack submarine, uh, which 
probably will also carry uh, long-range cruise missiles for you know, conventional strikes against land targets. But my sense is that uh, those attack submarines will be largely uh, anti-ship platforms rather than land attack platforms. So they always, they're always multi-mission um, boats and uh, United States submarines can do a lot of things, uh, including attacking land targets. Uh, but my sense is that it would be more consistent with the, the doctrine we've seen out of China that, uh, that the primary mission of those attack submarines will be to sink ships. With all of these increasing threats from Chinese missiles and subs and planes and the US putting more emphasis on the importance of their carriers, do you think that in the event of an actual war that the US might be hesitant to actually put its carriers in any sort of harm's way, knowing what the sinking of even just one of their carriers would mean for the US Navy and even the country's geopolitical prestige? Yeah, look, I think there's something to that um, for a couple of reasons. One is that the, the 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 American aircraft carrier fleet carries such public prestige, is such a potent symbol of American power that to lose one would be a massive blow to American prestige, uh, and would be you know politically, I think, very damaging for any any U.S. administration. Uh, the other factor though is probably a military or a strategic calculation which is that as long as the fleet is intact it has some deterrent value for uh, for future scenarios so if we're looking if we're thinking about taiwan for instance there tends to be an assumption that uh, the united states will lose uh, enormous credibility among its other allies in asia if it refuses to fight for uh, on Taiwan's side against any Chinese military action. But I think there's also a way to make the opposite argument, which is to say that allies such as Japan and Korea and maybe even Australia uh, would say to themselves that, well, you know, better that the United States keeps its powder dry for us rather than for Taiwan. Taiwan is lost anyway. Uh, it's too difficult to defend. So therefore, better that the United States keeps its capabilities intact in order to help us rather than to help Taiwan. So would the US actually throw in its best weapons in the event of a conflict with the Chinese over Taiwan? Or at this point, would it be bold to even park a carrier battle group in the South China Sea just to show that the US is here to stay? As whilst yes, it does give off a powerful message about the freedom of navigation and supremacy of the US Navy, the crews carrying out those operations would well know that being this close to China would mean that the potential first salvo of attack from China would most certainly have their names written on it. But then again, what is the point in having the biggest, most expensive weapons in the world if when push comes to shove, you never really use them? Well, to talk through this part of the problem, we turn to our final guest. Part 3. Eliminated by Economics So the carrier battle group has been the dominant currency of naval power since 1943, probably since 1942, right? Um, what the aircraft carrier does is it gives you uh, long reach, it gives you eyeballs wherever uh, you wherever you want those eyeballs to go, um, it gives you land strike, it gives you um, naval strike. Um, really, it's just sort of the center of what of what really any navy is trying to do. And uh, you know, mostly the question with aircraft carriers uh, is not whether a country country chooses to invest in them, um, but whether a country is capable of investing in them. And so, you know, that's why we see with the Indians and the Chinese and the Japanese and the British and the French, um, that even countries that have fairly limited uh, or have, have naval budgets that are much more limited than those of the United States, they also have focused a lot of their doctrine around a lot of their force structure around aircraft carriers, right? Because it has this huge political import, but it's also just a, a giant problem that anyone else has to deal with, right? A great big old flat deck ship um, that has range out uh, to hundreds of miles that can see hundreds of miles away and can hurt things hundreds of miles away. So it's not actually all that surprising. I, th I don't think that the United States has remained pretty committed to those big flat deck ships since uh, since the end of World War II, since the middle of World War II. And it's also not really surprising. I don't think that, that so many other countries um, have been Build their force structures, um, building their doctrines around around the same uh, the same thing, right? I mean, the aircraft carriers give you uh, a voice in international affairs. They give you uh, the ability 
to, uh, to, to effect military outcomes by uh, giving you lots of presence uh, in a place where, which, which you can move around, right? Um, so you deploy an aircraft carrier to, some, to uh, any point in the world and suddenly your country has a contribution to make with respect to the, uh, the political outcomes and the military outcomes you're looking for. So yeah, great big old flat deck ships that move around really fast and have lots of firepower. You don't have to reach too much to explain why a lot of countries find these important and why the premier naval power has has sort of constructed uh, its force structure around him. Robert Farley is a professor of security and diplomacy specializing in the Western Pacific at the Patterson School of Diplomacy and International Commerce at the University of Kentucky. He's also the author of Patents for Power, Intellectual Property Law, and the Diffusion of Military Technology, and has contributed extensively to a number of journals and magazines, including The National Interest, The Diplomat, APAC, The World Politics Review, and The American Prospect. And we're thrilled them on the show today. To the first question, which is, would we deploy a carrier or or another big, so a super carrier or another big flat deck ship into the Taiwan Strait uh, if we anticipated there was about to be a war? And I think the answer to that is no, right? The only reason we would put a carrier there is if we were absolutely certain there wasn't going to be war. Um, because as you as you noted, and as I think you're correct, um, you know there there are layer layers of lethality to China's anti-access area denial onion um, and uh, that 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 anti-access bubble or onion um, that anti-access bubble extends pretty far out into the Pacific but the closer you get into China's littoral the closer you get to the Chinese mainland the closer you get to being in range of China's short-range diesel subs China's uh, vast amount of uh, vast number of short-range and long-range aircraft it would strain credulity to suggest that in a real crisis, a militarized crisis, you would immediately see big, expensive, flat-decked American uh, warships in between Taiwan and China. What I think you would see, though, is uh, aircraft carriers, carrier battle groups, chipping away at the edges of uh, that anti-access bubble, essentially doing stuff that are going to affect the course of the conflict over Taiwan, right? So an aircraft carrier doesn't need to interpose itself between uh, Taiwan and China in order to make it much more difficult for the Chinese to uh, be able to literally invade Taiwan or to be able to establish air superiority over Taiwan. An aircraft carrier can do that from fairly far away, um, especially when that aircraft carrier is supported with tanker aircraft, with land-based aircraft, with drones, with satellites, and so forth. An aircraft carrier that is in an in, in area which is safer than immediately off Taiwan's coast can, can still have a big impact, right? It can still deliver ordnance, it can still deliver recon, can provide eyes on uh, the target. And it can also attract the attention of Chinese defenses, right? So we talk a lot about the ability of uh, Chinese, or in the past we talked about Soviet capabilities, to reach out and touch aircraft carriers. But that's an incredibly complicated game. And so if, if China is, for example, um, trying to reach out and touch or hurt an American aircraft carrier that is at some distance from China's coast, that's actually an enormously risky and enormously expensive activity for the Chinese to undertake. Anything they undertake is going to require using missile launchers, but they have a limited number, especially of very long range missiles. Um, it's going to require the use of Chinese drones, but they have a limited number of really advanced drones that can put eyes on the target. If the Chinese are going to use long range submarines, or if the Chinese are going to use long range aircraft um, to attempt to hurt the American carrier, those assets are also pretty vulnerable. I mean, China doesn't have that many long range bombers, and if they come within range of US air defenses, you don't, you don't get them back, right? Um, uh, you know, once they fly out there and they're intercepted by American interceptors, um, they're not landing in China again anytime soon. And so there are lots of ways that, that aircraft carriers can chip away at the edge of the bubble and that can influence events that are happening inside the bubble and create opportunities for other assets, that they're still an important contributor to any actual serious high intensity conflict between the United States and China over Taiwan even if they're not directly interposing themselves in the straits and even if they're not sort of literally destroying uh, Chinese amphibious warships as they're attempting to storm the beaches of Formosa. It's a question that might be obvious to some, but it's one that I still think merits asking. If these aircraft carriers are now having to operate over 3,000 miles away in the middle of the Pacific in order to strike China whilst keeping their carriers out of the range of Chinese missiles, why wouldn't they just use their allies' bases in much closer territories like Okinawa or South Korea, 
or even use US territories like Guam, which is only 1,900 miles from China's coast. Why go through all that effort of building a carrier to strike from a thousand miles further away? The first thing, first way to answer is that Okinawa is different uh, than Guam for really important reasons. Um, one is that that Okinawa depends on, and a lot of the other bases that we have across the Pacific depend on the goodwill of allies. And the goodwill of allies is an incredibly important thing to have, but it also builds in a natural vulnerability, right? Because no matter how good relations are between Tokyo and the United States, it's not actually the case that that the Japanese are necessarily going to be along on any adventure that we decide to find ourselves in. And so that differentiates, say, Okinawa and Guam. Now, Guam, super important. Um, one of the, I guess, probably the single most important difference between Guam and an aircraft carrier is that an aircraft carrier is a lot faster than Guam. Um, you know, Guam is pretty stationary. Now, on the upside, Guam is pretty hard to sink. It's a lot harder to sink than an aircraft carrier. Um, but the Chinese know where Guam is, and destroying all of the useful military facilities that can be used for um, example, launching aircraft and managing an air offensive, it takes the Chinese, it's pretty expensive for the Chinese to really damage all those facilities in Guam. But again, they know where Guam is and striking Guam is not a particularly difficult thing for the Chinese to do. Um, aircraft carriers are really big, but the ocean is much larger um, and aircraft carriers are really fast. And so the military problem created for the Chinese by having powerful mobile airfields, which is what the aircraft carriers are, is actually pretty substantial and it's a much bigger problem um, than is generated by having a stable, uh, having a stationary facility like the facilities we have in the wall. Now I think that, uh, you know, if we were to sort of look into the future and envision something like American bases in Taiwan, um, the, 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 it would be a little bit different, but the principle would remain the same facilities in Taiwan are great. You can't sink them, but also they don't move. And so the aircraft carrier's real value is its in its ability um, to be a fast mobile platform that the Chinese really have to pay attention to and that uses up a huge portion of their military assets to be able to neutralize. Obviously, the argument in all of this is heavily skewed by economics as well. If we take a look at the new Chinese Type 94 attack sub, which is a pretty good sub, they cost around 750 million US dollars, which does sound like a lot, but that's only around 0.5% the cost of a Gerald Ford, and that's before you even put staff in it or put planes on the deck, which means China could throw 200 Type 94 submarines at a US carrier, and even if that carrier goes down fighting, taking 199 Chinese subs with them, China still comes out economically ahead. With this massive financial imbalance, do you think it makes carriers a bit of a liability that if China does decide to just go for volume to overwhelm these carrier groups, that it just creates a large target for the Chinese to sink? Well, I would say absolutely it's a concern. Um, and and uh, the extraordinary expense of American aircraft carriers is probably the single thing that uh, creates the most lethal environment for the American aircraft carrier program, right? The fact that we can't produce them um, economically and we can't produce them very quickly. But when we say something like, when we make a comparison like, oh, you know, a submarine cost this much versus an aircraft carrier costs this much, um, and you can build in all kinds of all, all kinds of stuff beyond that um, in terms of uh, especially the aircraft carrier's expense because you got to buy the airplanes, you got to buy the uh, you got to buy the escort ships and so forth. What makes the Chinese submarines useful is not their mere existence. It is the fact that they are built into a really large, really sophisticated, and incredibly expensive set of sensors and set of uh, communications equipment that make the submarines useful. You know, even in World War II, it was pretty rare for submarines just to blunder into enemy aircraft carriers. And that was when both the Japanese and the Americans had lots and lots and lots and lots of submarines, right? Lots more submarines than the Chinese are ever going to be able to sort of usefully put into an area the size of the South China Sea. And so submarines, uh, hypersonic missiles, H-6 bombers, right? All of these things are very useful and very interesting um, tip of the spear type weapons. So why even bother with aircraft carriers if the Chinese have all these sorts of weapons available? 
all of these weapons are, are, are sexy and interesting, but um, they're only useful when they can be directed against a particular target, right? And this is where it matters um, that an aircraft carrier is mobile and can travel at 35 miles an hour, as opposed to an airbase on Guam, which is considerably less mobile. Um, and parts of this reconnaissance complex, which is going to go into space, but is also going to involve drones and undersea drones and really everything that's filtering data back to the original shooter who is in China or somewhere near China, all of these things are things that can be targeted by the carrier battle group and by assets associated with the carrier battle group. And all of them are things that are vulnerable. So it's a win for the United States when Chinese missiles fall harmlessly into the ocean. It's a huge expense for the Chinese when their missiles fall harmlessly into the ocean. And just sort of comparing the costs of, you know, even a particular missile launcher or a particular missile platform compared to the overall cost of the carrier battle group, or especially the aircraft carrier itself, can be misleading because there's this gigantic, huge hidden cost that the Chinese are paying in order to be able to direct um, their lethal systems towards the aircraft carrier. The US have been working on their anti-submarine operations in the hope to always keep their carriers safe in the event of a war, but in a large number of cases when they've had war games with allied nations, the US has failed these tests. On several occasions when the US has run war games against the Australians or the Japanese or even the Canadians, there have been quite a few occasions where the enemy team, particularly in the Australians, have managed to put a submarine directly in the middle of the carrier group without the US being aware. Even on one occasion, putting the submarine at point-blank torpedo range of the carrier before letting the Admiral know they were there. So let's put aside the credible threat of Chinese long-range stealth bombers, or the new Chinese hypersonic missiles, which Beijing claims can hit a US carrier whilst it's traveling at full speed nearly 80% of the time, if a normal diesel-powered submarine piloted by Australians can get that close as to be able to take a point-blank shot against an aircraft carrier, surely that worries the US Admiralty. Right, so, uh, I mean, that question has a couple of different answers. The first is that we don't we don't actually have that great of certainty with respect to the ability of even uh, Australian, British, Canadian, and so forth, NATO, NATO-class submarines to... To, uh, approach, uh, to approach a carrier battle group. And the second answer is that Chinese submarines aren't as good, right? They, Chinese submarines aren't as good, uh, generally speaking, as the uh, submarines that um, are participating in these kinds of exercises, right? And so, I mean, if the Chinese are stuck into a position where they are relying upon submarines um, to be able to approach and destroy uh, the carrier, then it's really going to be hit and miss. Um, and it's also a pretty expensive proposition because their nuclear submarines are going to be sitting out there unsupported, where they're going to be vulnerable to a whole set of different anti-submarine assets, where the, the Americans and the Japanese are not going to be waiting for permission to shoot, right? If they identify a Chinese submarine, one that's uh, moving much more quietly, much, much more slowly, uh, likely, than the uh, carrier battle group itself, then that, that submarine itself becomes pretty vulnerable uh, pretty quickly to modern anti-submarine warfare. We already discussed this earlier on the piece, that the primary use of aircraft carriers is for major powers to be able to gain local air supremacy against minor or regional powers, nations that may not have huge local air forces. And this is one of the best uses of having an aircraft carrier fleet as it allows you to project air supremacy almost anywhere in the globe. If we look at the fact, though, that China is currently fast-tracking a carrier fleet of its own, do you think that indicates that Beijing may be looking to project military force outside of its own current backyard? Absolutely. I mean, there's no reason. There's no reason to. There's no reason to build a gigantic mobile airfield just to project power within a space that uh, can be reached by land-based air, right? I mean, the, the, fundamentally, the only reason you want aircraft carriers is if you want to project power to a space that cannot be easily covered uh, by by land-based fighters and land-based bombers. I think that really one of the big places that the Chinese are thinking about in terms of the utility of aircraft carriers is not so much the Pacific, um, although they're certainly important in the Pacific, but uh, really in the Indian Ocean, where you know they can envision uh, aircraft carriers being a way to establish sea control in a space where uh, China otherwise does not have a lot of assets um, that are useful. And the Indian Ocean is incredibly important economically to China, not just for energy, but for all kinds of, of other goods um, that are that are uh, being exported out of or that are being uh, imported into um, major Chinese 
ports. And so the ability to have a presence in the Indian Ocean um, sort of, I think, is one of the things that justifies China's approach to these big carrier battle groups, probably as much or more so than, than you know, kind of this vision of um, aircraft carriers operating out deep in the Pacific and, and playing cat and mouse with American uh, carrier battle groups. And so in a sense, uh, you know, it's almost Almost as if people who should really be worried about Chinese carrier battle groups um, are the Indians and other people who are operating in the Indian Ocean. The current Gerald Ford supercarrier class is currently only contracted to build just four units, upon which the US Navy will then have to make a decision on what direction the following generation of aircraft carriers will have to go in. Some are suggesting the next class should be even bigger to fit even more planes onto the decks or accommodate bigger planes with longer range. Others are suggesting going smaller like some of the old British carriers used to be and switch the carrier's operational focus to launching UAVs from their decks. And others are suggesting the US move to building small carriers, focusing on vertical takeoff and helicopter carriers, with these being a lot smaller than a Gerald Ford, but for the same price they could afford to build many, many more and split up their targets. So which direction do you think the US Navy will take once the Gerald Ford class has been finished? So the sort of the next big question in naval aviation, I think, is not the question of, uh, which is sort of you allude to, is not the question of whether um, the United States is going to continue to build great big flat deck ships that can carry aircraft. It's the question of how big are those ships are going to, how big are those ships going to be and what specifically are their capabilities going to look like. The Indians, the British, to an extent the Chinese, have all been uh, thinking and talking a lot and working a lot um, uh, on smaller aircraft carriers. And the British aircraft carriers are not small, they're 60,000 tons. Um, so these are, these are big, uh, big flat deck ships. But the question for the future is, you know, how much more bang for the buck do you really get from having a Ford class carrier that can launch 160 sorties of uh, sophisticated generation five aircraft um, and, you know, can really create a military problem by doing that versus a smaller ship? that's much less expensive, that doesn't have incredibly sophisticated catapults, doesn't need them, um, and is instead a, uh, a mothership for a whole ton of different unmanned aerial vehicles. And sometimes those unmanned aerial vehicles, they can play a lot of the roles that sophisticated F-35Cs uh, can play um, on a Gerald Ford carrier. Um, and I think that the fact that you sort of we, we're only projecting out to four Fords at this point, which I think are I want to say it's the John Kennedy, the the Enterprise, and the Dory Miller, in addition to the Ford. Um, you know, I think I think that the 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 Navy is hedging a little bit, and the industry is hedging a little bit, sort of looking at what the environment for uh, naval aviation, um, what the lethality situation, the lethality environment is going to look like in 20 years when we're closing in on the end of that buy, and. Is there just going to be more bang for the buck from building three much smaller aircraft carriers that aren't going to fl fly an F-35C? Maybe they'll fly F-35Bs, but their main air group is going to be unmanned vehicles that are doing all of the missions that we expect naval aviation to do. And so I think, I think what we have right now is a hedge, right? We're hedging on what the future of naval aviation is going to look like. One of the factors I'm sure they're taking into account when deciding on the next generation of aircraft carriers is the rapid development of hypersonic missiles from Russia and China, with these missiles frequently dubbed as carrier killers. The newest generation of Russian hypersonics apparently have a top speed of Mark 27, which is far too quick for most of the warning systems to even pick it up, let alone prevent it. And on top of that, the Russian missiles can apparently change trajectories and directions to throw off sensors as well. Obviously, when it comes to the new Russian hypersonic program, exact facts and figures are pretty hard to get a hold of. But even if we take the high estimate, the cost is around $100 million per missile, and the low number on accuracy, which is that it hits a carrier around 70% of the time, and we make the assumption that the American carriers are designed well enough to survive one or two hypersonic hits, we can pretty quickly see that the economics just don't add up. So as an example, if we're Russia or China, and we want to be really sure that we tank out your aircraft carrier, we decide to throw eight hypersonic missiles at your Ford class just to be sure this would mean the Chinese spending $800 million to sink that ship, which, as we established earlier on, full of planes and staff, would be worth $25 billion, which would mean China spending just 
of what the US would lose in that strike and suffer no casualties as opposed to the US who would likely lose thousands of men and women. The US are trying to counter this with an anti-ballistic missile program to shoot down these hypersonics, but as we saw from the ABM work done in the 80s, anti-ballistic missiles are pretty inaccurate, as what they're trying to do is akin to shooting a bullet with another bullet. Some estimates put their accuracy rate around the 5-10%, to and their price tag as even more expensive than some of the basic hypersonic missiles. Surely these developments in hypersonic missile technology are giving a lot of US naval analysts a bit of pause at the moment. Well, there's no way to guarantee that a, that a ballistic missile, that a, uh, a terminally guided ballistic missile won't hit an aircraft carrier. And in fact, um, you know, we have to divide hypersonics between, you know, the, 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 what kind of hypersonic systems there actually are and what they do. The hypersonic glide vehicles that people are really worried about from a strategic perspective actually aren't harder to kill than a terminally guided ballistic missile. Um, you know, a, terminally, a terminally guided ballistic missile, um, which the Chinese already have, is is really, really fast. It's hypersonic. It's hypersonic. It's faster, in fact, than a hypersonic glide vehicle. You know, the, the difference is on is in the strategic impact because the glide vehicle is harder to it's harder to tell where it's coming from. But there's lots of reason to think that a glide vehicle will be easier for the air defenses of a carrier battle group to deal with um, than a, a traditional ballistic missile, but one that's terminally guided, because the ballistic missile is going to be coming in at a much harder to intercept uh, uh, angle and it's becoming going to be coming faster than the than the hypersonic uh, glide vehicle. So, you know, I think that the, the, the environment has become more lethal for aircraft carriers. I don't think it actually has that much to do with hypersonics per se. I think it has to do with the terminally guided ballistic missiles that China and other countries have developed. But I also think it has to do with UAVs, uh, suicidal drone swarms, um, a variety of other ways that, uh, that a country could use unmanned systems um, in either to either destroy or uh, damage an aircraft carrier. So with all this in mind, do you think the thing that will kill the United States supercarrier in the end will most likely be economics? That with all of the carrier killing weapons out there at the moment, the US may become increasingly hesitant in the future to put all of their eggs in so few baskets. Right. I mean, on, on that question, I think we have to go back to this distinction between big carriers and small carriers, right? I, I, I will go out on a limb and say that a gigantic floating airfield um, that moves really, really quickly across 70% of the Earth's surface is always going to be militarily useful. The question of how useful it's going to be is compared, you know, it's, it's, it's going to be uh, uh, how much better that giant expensive platform is than a platform that costs half as much, that's slightly slower, that doesn't have the catapults. Um, and so forth, because you know, if if we develop the kinds of unmanned systems that can strike just as deeply as an F-35 can strike, um, that can conduct exactly the same kind of electronic warfare um, that a an EA-18 Growler can do, but that can do so uh, a lot less expensively and can be launched from a 40,000 ton flat deck ship rather than a hundred than a hundred thousand ton flat deck ship, then I think we're going to say to ourselves, it's like, look. Right. I mean, this is this is something that's happened before. Right. Now, in the surface fleet, we made a shift from forty five thousand ton ships down to ten thousand ton ships because the, the technology changed, um, the threat environment changed. And so we decided upon uh, vessels that were perhaps less survivable, but also a lot less expensive and they could have a lot of the same impact. So I think it's entirely realistic to, to look at the future and and like sort of step back and say, depending on which direction the technology goes, absolutely the Ford carriers could seem like uh, an exorbitant luxury. And it absolutely would make sense to instead focus on America class ships um, that, that are much smaller, but also much cheaper. Um, but I think we need to be careful right now about predicting which direction the technology is going to go. So in the event of an evasion in Taiwan, the US has a really tough decision to make. On one hand, people will be calling on them to throw their carriers in to gain the air supremacy over the Taiwan Strait. 
with every Taiwanese general knowing that even if the Chinese did manage to get their boots onto the Taiwanese coast by surprise in the first few days, that with the US gaining back air supremacy thanks to their aircraft carriers over the island and the strait, it would make supplying the Chinese invasion force nearly impossible for Beijing. And as a rule of war, it really doesn't matter how good your troops are. If they have no fuel in their tanks or ammunition in their guns, they're little more than badly dressed tourists. But as much as the Taiwanese would be calling for the US to throw in every carrier they have, but by the US putting these carriers into the combat zone, it creates a moment of truth, a put up or shut up time. In that moment, either the US saves Taiwan, gains control of the air, and forever confines China to the first island chain, or the Chinese hypersonic missiles do their job, and in the blink of an eye, hit their targets. And the US loses multiple carriers in a single day, tens of thousands of sailors, billions of dollars, and decades of development are wasted in seconds as these steel behemoths creak towards the bottom of the sea floor. And even if China wasn't completely sure about hypersonic missiles, why wouldn't they try for it? Even if Beijing launched 8, 9, even 50 hypersonics at a carrier, as long as they sink that carrier, China still comes out economically ahead. There is no denying a carrier's usefulness against minor or regional powers, and time and time again the aircraft carrier has turned the tables of war and been the decisive factor. But against a major power, that's where the argument gets tricky. Decision makers in Washington now need to decide whether to double down and build even bigger carriers with even more escorts that can hopefully survive even more punishment, which in turn creates an even bigger bill and an even juicier target. Or they look to break up their small aircraft carriers, limiting their operational abilities, but creating a situation where one or two being lost wouldn't be akin to an entire World War I worth of casualties occurring in an afternoon. This is the decision the US Admiralty will have to make very soon, and the decision here will indicate whether we're prepping for future wars against Timpod dictators where we have air supremacy with one aircraft carrier, or we're preparing for war with the world's most populous nation. Thank you so much for tuning into the show this week. This has been a really interesting one to put together. My two big interests in life are war and economics, and this story has them both. So as much as I enjoyed it, I really hope you enjoyed it as well. And feel free to let us know. Or feel free to message us if you have any ideas for future episodes, as the idea for this episode actually came to us from one of our Patreons. So we love hearing about episode ideas, as this episode turned out to be way more interesting than any one of us thought it would be. If you do want to send us a message, or you want to connect with me directly, you can get in touch with us and find all of our links and info on Twitter, Reddit, Instagram, Facebook, Discord, and TikTok on the handle at the Redline Pod. Or if you can to follow me on Twitter, I'm on the handle at Mike Elliott Oz. Oz is in Australia. I know new listeners to the show heard us talking about aircraft carriers and were probably eagerly awaiting for a mobile game sponsorship to pop up in the middle of the episode. But so we can maintain our independence and journalistic integrity, we don't do advertising on this show. And I don't think anyone wants to hear me talking about genocide and HelloFresh in the same sentence. See, this show is completely funded by our amazing Patreons. And as an example of an amazing Patreon, this episode is dedicated to friend of the show, Chad Hansen, who is the latest patron to sign up as of time of recording. This show is only possible with the support of listeners like Chad, who donate a small amount of money each month to help us keep this show going. And we cannot thank them enough. So if you feel you can spare a couple of dollars, we'd greatly appreciate it. So this episode on our aircraft carriers becoming obsolete is thanks to you, Chad. As usual, here are our three book recommendations. The first is How to Build an Aircraft Carrier by Chris Terrell for a look at the economics of these huge ships. The second is Sea Power by James Stavridis for a look at how aircraft carriers changed doctrines and shaped conflicts around the globe. And the third is Sea Power States by Andrew Lambert for a look at the evolution of naval warfare. I want to say thanks to this week's guest, Strykinomir, who's one of the best YouTube channels on this subject, Sam Rogovin and Robert Farley, all of you were absolutely splendid to work with on this one. I also want to say thanks to my staff, Webb McCarr, the producer, Perry Grace, Danielle Isabella, Isaac Gibbs, Andrew Garbery and Robbie Sutton, our research assistants and writers, Francis Leach, our director of Breaking News, Mark Spencer, our second voiceover artist, Jonah Gunn, our production assistant, Jamie Thanu, our media director, Ross Crabtree, our media advisor, Joe Horth, our audio cleaner, Marissa Rafter, our videographer, and Nick Much, our field correspondent. I say it every single time, and I mean it every single time. This crew is the best of the best, and we're very lucky to have them on the show. The Red Line will be back in another fortnight with another international episode. But until then, thank you for listening, and good night.
The views and opinions expressed in this episode are solely those of Michael, our guests, and the Redline podcast. They do not represent any government or organization and are solely our own. For more information, please visit theredlinepodcast.com.